Thank you, Matt, and uh, welcome to everybody who, who's joined us from wherever you are, and I uh, hope you're and safe, um, and that whilst the world is in lockdown, um, the digital world is not in lockdown, and that we can uh, reach you by the wonders of technology. This is the third in our series of uh, lectures that we're giving online. And today I'm going to talk about the lakes and fountains of Castle Howard. Well, water has always been in plentiful supply at Castle Howard. Early estate maps, for example, show the area with a number of natural springs and streams, all of which predate Bamber's building. And doubtless the easy supply of water was a major consideration behind the establishment of the village and old castle at Henderskelf in the Middle Ages. With the building of Castle Howard, begun in 1699 by the third Earl of Carlisle, the opportunities for exploiting these water resources for both ornamental and practical purposes grew considerably. If we look at an ordnance survey map, we can see many of the features, which of course are all man-made components of the landscape. So for example, here marked in a pale blue this little circular uh, here is Raywood Reservoir, built in the early 18th century with a view to supplying the house with water and feeding a wealth of ornamental cascades and fountains inside the wood. In 1724, the South Lake was created, and in the 1730s, New River beyond to the southeast. And at the end of the century, the Great Lake and Dairy Pond. Uh, were constructed to the north of the house. Now in the 1850s and 1860s, both lakes were altered by William Andrews Nesfield, leading garden designer of the day. On the north side of the house, he fashioned an additional pond. And in the south grounds, which is where we're going to concentrate today, he installed fountains and waterways beyond the South Lake with a cascade and a waterfall. So it's important to remember that while Castle Howard is rightly a famous 18th century landscape, much of what one sees and enjoys today is the result of extensive Victorian involvement in the grounds. And the restoration work of recent decades has concentrated principally on re-establishing the South Waterways, but important work was carried out on the Great Lake to the North as well. And in both cases, the aim was not so much to recreate a historical image as to carry out important restoration and repair work. And much of the dredging, clearing and rebanking made sense purely in conservation terms. And the immediate result of all this work was the exposure of the waterways, previously obscured by thick vegetation. But at the same time, however, certain aesthetic decisions had to be taken to ensure that the reconstituted waterways and vistas fitted within the overall environment. Now the background to the lakes and fountains begins 170 years ago when Nesfield made his first appearance at Castle Howard around 1850. His first commission was to modify the shoreline of the North Lake, but shortly afterwards he began a series of major alterations to the South Parterre and South Lake. Ideas first envisaged in a watercolour he painted from a vantage point of the mausoleum looking back to the house in a, south, in a northwesterly direction. And here, if we look at the detail on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, we can see how Nesfield depicts two fountains, and right in the back of the painting, we get a little sense of an elaborate parterre on the garden front, south of the house. And the aim here was to replace the plain lawn that contained the last remnants of Vambra's scheme from the century before, with a few statues dotted around and on the extreme right hand of this picture, uh, a column. The idea was to embellish this area with a contemporary design. 
and the seventh Earl of Carlisle agreed to these proposals, and the works had just commenced when Queen Victoria visited Castle Howard in August 1850. Three years later, in October 1853, Nesfield and his engineer James Easton witnessed a successful demonstration of both fountains. An engineering concern had been whether there would be ample water supply for both fountains, but Nesfield was able to report a satisfactory result, and in his letter to the seventh Earl, as was his habit, he included a pair of thumbnail sketches illustrating the effects of the water jets. As for the finished parterre, this was an elaborate creation, as seen in this photograph of around 1870, revealing the intricate embroidered design together with the dominant position of the Atlas Fountain, which had been carved from Portland stone by the sculptor John Thomas. Weighing 24 tons, it had been brought by rail from London to Yorkshire in separate pieces and assembled on site. Now Nesfield's landscape alterations may have reflected contemporary fashions in Victorian garden design, but ironically his parterre designs were self-consciously historical, closely drawn from 17th century French examples by such practitioners as André Le Nôtre, the famous gardener at Versailles. And following the completion of the parterre, it was illustrated in one of the most important publications of the day, Advino Brooks' The Gardens of England, published in 1857. And here it's possible to see the full polychromatic effect of bedding plants, box hedging, and coloured gravels that make up the elaborate geometrical pattern. Now no plans of his parterre survive, but it has been possible to recreate the design digitally. You can see on the right how the parterre comprises a dense kind of knot of scrolls for lutes and little small crosslets just visible at the bottom of the design here. Indeed, one irate neighbour wrote into the Earl of Carlisle describing these as unnecessarily popish. The installation of the fountains and the parterre entailed huge costs. Nesfield's initial estimate of £2,000 proved wildly inaccurate, and after five years the costs had spiralled to a staggering £10,000, to the despair of those managing the estate against a backdrop of falling rents. And even the seventh Earl confessed to being delinquent in his extravagance, whilst the clerks in the office christened Nesfield as Mr Ness Fiddle, although there's no evidence he was being dishonest. But within 30 years of completion, Nesfield's landscaping was swept away by Rosalind Howard, the ninth Countess of Carlisle, in the 1890s. From their earliest visits to Castle Howard, she and her husband were alarmed at the cost of maintaining the gardens, especially at the expense of improving the tenant farms. Thus, her erasure of Nesfield's parterre and her alterations to the lake were prompted in part by aesthetic considerations, the fashions for such parterres had passed by the end of the century, but they also had a very real way of making economies. And photographs in a family album show a gang of young workers levelling the parterre and with the help of a specially laid piece of railway track, a railway wagon was, was used to remove the spoil, some of which was used to soften the geometry of the South Lake shoreline. And undeterred by winter weather, the Countess supervised later stages of these operations herself during a snowstorm in January 1894. And for those who lament the passing of Nesfield's landscape, solace might be taken from her diary entry for the following day, which reads, in, in all day with bad rheumatism and a cold. Well, these resultant economies transformed the parterre into the grass terrace with yew hedges 
uh, we know today, which of course is much easier to maintain than the previous scheme. All of those little colored gravel paths required hand weeding. It was intensely labor, uh, um, it was in very labor intensive to run that particular parterre. And of course, the Atlas Fountain uh, stays in place. There was never any question of removing that as the centerpiece. But in the 1860s, Nesfield had returned to Castle Had to advise on extending the waterways uh, beyond the South Lake. And here the aim was to exploit the vista between the house and the mausoleum, a sense of which can just be seen with this sideways view from the parterre, if we're looking, looking east. And there, peeping above the tree line, is the top of the mausoleum. And of course, this is a view that worked in the opposite direction. Nesfield had already explored that in his watercolour, but a contemporary view today, an aerial view, shows us that spectacular vista back from the mausoleum to the house. Now, a photograph taken in the 1870s reveals how successfully he achieved this effect of a broad view from the house across the South Lake to New River Bridge in the middle distance and the mausoleum beyond. The trompe l'oeil effect is impressive with the illusion of an almost continuous level sheet of water between the South Lake and New River Bridge. In fact, there's a drop of nearly 40 feet between them, as we'll see in a few moments. But this scheme barely outlasted the century or two. By 1900, the slopes above the lake were beginning to be planted with trees and shrubs, which would in time completely obscure the vista. And these photographs chronicle the gradual disappearance. This first pair, uh, taken uh, around the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th, um, show at the end of the 19th century uh, a select few plantings on that lawn. But on the bottom right, you see uh, a sequence of crabapple trees, thorns, and rhododendrons beginning to sprout up into a big thicket. This picture is about 1910, 1911, we think. Well, in time, these would mature. So at the moment, this photograph was taken shortly after the Second World War, looking out from the house, it reveals the extent to which the vegetation covered everything, obscuring that open panorama of Nesfield's time. And you can just make out the mausoleum beyond all these trees and shrubs. Well, the restoration work began in the late 1980s, with a view to opening up these waterways, from the South Lake here, through the South Waterways of Nesfield's design to New River beyond, nearly a mile in length. And it was also uh, aimed at restoring the fountains to full working order. All of this part of the landscape had been neglected during the 20th century. And the start of this work was marked by repairs to the reservoir in Ray Wood. Since this was the source of water supply to the South Waterways, any full restoration program would have to begin here. Now this schematic chart shows how the reservoir feeds both fountains. If we look at the aerial view, the reservoir is hidden in the thicket of trees just where I'm circling the cursor now with the parterre there and the South Lake there. Well, holding half a million gallons of water, the circular reservoir is supplied from a beck in the village of Conisthorpe, nearly a mile away to the north. And originally the water was pumped uphill to the reservoir by a steam engine. Now, the reservoir always had a reputation for leaking badly. And when drained, it was clear that the stonework was eroded and some of the flags on the floor had shifted to expose the clay beneath. So the basin was fully drained, a butyl liner marked in blue as you can see in this top picture here was laid on top of the clay bed and then the stonework reinstated. One can't help wondering whether they remembered to remove the wheelbarrow before reflooding the reservoir. But with the reservoir empty it was also an opportunity 
to inspect the carvings on the old 18th century pedestal in the center of the basin. And these depict an array of marine creatures and vegetation on just one facade facing the west. And of course, most of the time, these figures are concealed beneath the waterline. So there's a bit of a mystery to the reason for having these creatures here on the pedestal if they're going to be below the water. I suspect that there is an assumption that the water in the reservoir would be crystal clear so that they would be shimmeringly apparent beneath the water surface. Two years later, work began on the Atlas Fountain on the South Parterre, which, like the second fountain in the lake, is gravity fed from the reservoir, as this schematic drawing shows. The reservoir is about 70 feet above on the hilltop in the wood. Now with the Atlas Fountain, the problem was a leaking basin, particularly awkward since it's not a sunken one, it sits above ground level. Again, a liner had to be installed and then the stonework rejointed to create a waterproof seal. At the same time, it was possible to inspect the massive brick-built chamber beneath the fountain. It's reached by a small narrow underground passage that leads you into this central chamber where there is an enormous manifold as you see on the top left here which distributes the water through various subsidiary pipes as you can see in the bottom left here that follow through into smaller outlying chambers in this entire complex uh, in order to feed the various nozzles in the sculpture above. And on the right of your screen you see the central pipe going vertically up through the center of the, res of, of the fountain that will eventually uh, lead to the globe that Atlas is holding above. And the water jets and the nozzles in the Triton shells and at the top of the globe were all refurbished to ensure a smooth flow. And you can see on the right too that the signs of the zodiac around the globe were also regilded. And similar repairs were made to the shallow scallop shell basins that also contain hidden jets, thereby ensuring that the dramatic whitewater effect of the fountain was continued, the thing that had concerned Nesfield so much in designing the fountain in the first place. Well, the next phase was the South Lake itself. And in September 1987, the arrival of heavy digging and dredging machinery marked the start of this operation. The lake perimeter was cleared of the larger trees and bushes that overhung the water's edge. The reeds were removed, allowing the banks to be redefined. And the lake was drained to expose, to expose the puddled clay bed and allow the contractors to attack the mass of lily roots, some of which were almost four inches thick. And because of the clay bed, machinery was not brought directly onto the floor of the lake. The area was cleared by way of a drag line, with a special care taken not to puncture the clay lining. And with the lake empty, Nesfield's Prince of Wales fountain came to light. And since no plans existed, this was a unique opportunity to understand the engineering. Now the effect of the main and secondary jets was of course depicted in Nesfield's sketch on the left hand side in the top picture here. This is the second fountain, the Prince of Wales fountain. And of course it is faintly visible in this 1870s photograph. You can just see the ghostly outline of the water there. Incidentally on the extreme left of this picture, as I was saying earlier on how difficult it was to maintain this parterre, here you see a crouching gardener weeding the gravel paths. This was going to surely spell the end of the parterre as it became too expensive to maintain. However, with the fountain excavated on the lake, it was discovered that the lead feeder pipes for the subsidiary jets fed from the overflow of the Atlas fountain had been bent flat onto the lake bed. On the left hand side you see the strong big vertical central jet that is the main um, spout, but below it you can see here radiating a set of 
eight subsidiary pipes. Now these had all been bent flat onto the lake bed over the years. So what, were the, what was necessary to do was to reposition them in a correct upright position to create vertical jets of water. And here they are sticking up above the water, supported by little bits of timber. And when the fountain was turned on for the first time, the jets were a spectacular red, owing of course to all the corrosion in the pipes. They just about cleared by the time this photograph was taken. And thereafter, it was simply a question of flooding the lake. And today the fountains operate at weekends and in the summer months, water levels permitting. And the central jet reaches almost the height of 60 feet, which is what Nesfield had hoped for. It can be suppressed if there are strong winds on a day. Now below the lake sit the formal waterways developed in the 1860s during Nesfield's second phase of work. The Cascade, Temple Hole Basin and the Waterfall. This was the next stage of the project. And these began with the Cascade, which is fed directly from the overflow of the lake. And early photographs show how overgrown the area was and how in need of repair was much of the stonework, which leaked badly. Well, the stone was renewed and the face of the Cascade made waterproof. And the horizontal ridges across the slope were cleaned and refurbished. And these are very important, as you will see from this picture, because they will ensure a uniform flow of water when the cascade is in action, but also they create a dramatic white water effect as the water runs over those horizontal ridges. And at the far end of Temple Hole Basin stands the waterfall, which was in danger of imminent collapse. Over the years, tree roots had taken um, hold of the stonework, and water erosion had made further damage it, and not only did the face itself leak, but we can see how it was in danger of collapsing and had to be shored up by timber props. Repairs began in 1989, and the face was rebuilt with largely new stone. And by the end of the year, it was possible to test the waterfall, working properly for the first time in decades. And you'll notice that about a third of the way down, the water starts to uh, project away from the face of the waterfall. This is because there is a little stone protrusion there that Nesfield introduced precisely to throw the water out in an enhanced dramatic way. Now at this point, the project moved from 19th century water features to an earlier design period for the landscape. Beyond the waterfall lies New River, seen here in a drawing of the 18th century. This was a narrow stream that was widened into a serpentine river in the 1730s in order eventually to accommodate New River Bridge, marked on the drawing here and of course visible from the air in this view here. The autumn of 1988 saw work begin with clearing by forestry teams, cutting down much of the self-sown alder and willow lining the banks. And the river was drained and its original configuration started to become visible. By spring 1989, the bed had dried out and a mechanical digger began gradually to work its way down the course of the river. This operation consisted of two men and two pieces of plant and a period of fine dry weather meant that the quarter of a mile of waterway was completed in a matter of weeks. And you can see on the right hand picture how the job involved digging out the silt and sludge to a depth of three feet, levelling the bed and refashioning the banks to recover the 18th century serpentine shape. And it was intriguing to reflect on what two men and two pieces of machinery could accomplish in a matter of weeks compared to the months that a whole army of labourers with spades and barrows would have required when the river was originally fashioned in the 18th century. And here we see a pair of before and after images. 
On the top left, you can hardly discern the river beneath all that vegetation. On the bottom right, you can see the clean lines once it had been cleared and rebanked and flooded. But with the west side of the river cleared, it was also time to begin work on the bridge itself. And this cross section chart at the top left shows how the levels descend along this watercourse from the lake down the cascade, across Temple Hole, down the waterfall, and eventually to New River Bridge, which acts as a dam with a drop in level from the west side to the east of some 10 feet. The water rises up the gentle incline on the west side here and flows beneath the arch, each arch, before cascading down on the far side. And prior to this project, it was common to see water leaking through the stonework on the eastern side. Here we can see how badly eroded the stone is. It's collapsed down to the ground. There's water trickling through the stonework here. And look at how the trees have really taken firm root in the facade, causing more damage. Well, each of the dam faces on the eastern side was rebuilt, as were the flats below the arches. All the old stone was removed and a butyl liner placed across the surface. And this in turn was covered with stone flags and a lead pelmet installed at the top of the drop. And the work was completed in the summer of 1990. After that, it was simply a matter of flooding the western section of the river and allowing the water level to flow across the dam top before cascading down on the eastern side. And this was a very pleasing sight to see, but also it was acoustically pleasing too, to hear the sound of splashing water coming down each of the three cascades. And then on the east side of the bridge, the story was a familiar one. The river lost beneath a mass of vegetation and the bed clogged with silt, reeds and trees, all of which had been self-sown over the years. Well, after draining this stretch over the winter, an, ex an excavator was able to begin dredging in the summer of 1990. It was a different machine to that used on the western section because the riverbed here is very soft. So the excavator had to position large wooden mats along its path for the caterpillar tracks uh, to create a, a floating platform. And positioning these with its bucket, which was operated by a hydraulic line, rather like an elephant using its trunk. Well, New River was cleared in just under a month, thanks again to a concerted spell of dry weather. And a set of views taken from the top of the bridge before, during and after the operations show the scale of work involved in recovering this stretch of the river. Again, the vegetation on the top left, halfway through on the top right, and you can see how much silt is yet to be dug out. And then on the bottom picture, like another serpentine shape as the banks have been reclaimed and redefined. Now it was at this stage of the operations that the most intriguing archeological discovery was made at the eastern section of the water, right at the far end. New River East terminates in a crescent shaped dam made out of earth. And this revealed various mechanisms for controlling the levels and outflow of water. And although they're not part of Nesfield's scheme, these drainage systems look to date from the 19th century. But to what purpose? Well, we can see from this picture the how New River terminates in the Eastern Dam at the foot of Kirk Hill to the north, on which stands the mausoleum, just visible through the trees. If we take an aerial view of this, we can see how on the extreme left you have the serpentine shape of New River East and the earthen shaped dam is roughly where my cursor is now with the mausoleum just to the north northeast there on the top of the hill. But from this point New River continues as a small beck through Loudy Gill Wood along a narrow wooded course before joining another stream 
a mile away at Low Gately Mill. And at this point in our explorations, there was something of a light bulb moment. The complicated set of culverts and chambers at the Eastern Dam were obviously intended to regulate the water supply for the mill nearly half a mile away. And if we go back in time to the earliest estate map of the area, dated 1694, before Castle Howard had been built, this is the map of Old Henderskill. But let's look at this little area towards the bottom right of this 1694 map. Look at the shape of this woodland here. This is Loudy Gill Wood. Look at the shape of the woodland in this Ordnance Survey map. It's virtually identical. And so the old stream that was the sub that was widened at one point into New River, the stream always continued through Loudy Gill Wood and met up at a new at Low Gately Mill. And Low Gately Mill is marked in on the 1694 estate map, just as it is on the Ordnance Survey map. So it became apparent that this sequence of waterways, whatever their ornamental purpose, had also been a vital source of energy for operating the mill. And little did anyone think that when work began on the waterways in 1987, that the final destination of all this water was to be this vernacular building containing a milling chamber 20 feet underground, the disused mill at Low Gately. And consequently, we've come to recognise that the history of the lakes and waterways at Castle Howard has this dual identity. On the one hand, ornamental, full of sophisticated, pleasing effects, and on the other, the practical and utilitarian, as that very same water supply issues into a working mill. And therefore, we can say that this building on the top of the screen, unused and almost derelict, is directly connected with this grand house more than a mile away in the bottom of the screen. They share a vital link of water that has been created and controlled for a variety of purposes. But it was only through the recovery of these waterways from a concealed stretch that looked like this on the left to a reconstituted set of lakes, basins, waterfalls, dams and outflows looking like this on the right, that, the, that such a connection became apparent. And the dramatic impact of this project can very simply be measured by looking at how much more blue is visible in the right-hand picture compared to the left when it was all still covered by vegetation. So the operation led to not only the physical recovery of the waterways for the enjoyment of visitors to Castle Howard. The project was also a lesson in history, revealing things about the Castle Howard landscape through excavation as well as digging in the archives. And Castle Howard is rightly famed as an 18th century landscape, but much altered in the course of that century. And equally, we should not forget the Victorian interventions which are now recognized for their worth. And of course, the restoration work of the late 20th century has formed another contribution to the evolution of the landscape. And each of these moments tells us something about the history of taste, architecture, engineering, horticulture, and so on. Well, of course, all gardens are records of appearance and disappearance construction and decay, the fashionable and the outmoded. But as the recent restoration work has shown, with every disappearance, there can come a reappearance. Well, that concludes my talk on the fountains at Castle Howard. Um, the whole idea of restoration and continual change at Castle Howard is going to be a theme through many of these talks. Um, and so watch out for topics in future weeks. Um, I'm very happy now um, through the uh, uh, services of Matt as Master of Ceremonies to take any questions that you might have. Hello, are there any plans to resume the mill work? 
that's a, a commonly asked question. We, it would be a very nice thing to do, but to be honest, in the scale of uh, restoration challenges we have, it is very, very low down on our list of priorities. At one point, we, we did entertain some uh, blue sky thinking about wouldn't it be nice to restore the mill, make it a working mill again, perhaps grind corn that's grown on the estate, um, perhaps use the mill as a way of recycling the water back into the waterways, because in fact, beyond the mill, all of this water issues into the River Derwent and then eventually out into the North Sea. So lovely idea as it is, I think it's going to remain hypothetical for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of other questions that have come in on the chat, Chris. We've got one, um, how is the water pumped up to the reservoir today? Originally in Nesfield's time, it was a steam engine, which actually exercised him greatly about whether it was powerful enough to pump the water up. Today, it's quite simply, it's an electrical pump and we pump the water from the North Lake rather than the Beck itself. The lake is adjacent to the Beck in the village of Kernisthorpe to the north. Uh, and again, the flow up into the reservoir is going to be wholly dependent upon uh, water conditions, if you like. I mean, how, um, how much hot weather we've had, how much lack of rain and things like that. So inevitably that might mean in hot summer months that the um, opportunity to play the fountains fully has to be rationed. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, another one, is New River Bridge the best place for the public to see the waterfall and the eastern parts of New River? It's a great spot to stand. You can look back and see the waterfall and just get a glimpse of, of Castle Howard beyond. Um, and if you turn around in the opposite direction, you can see the river and of course a great view of the mausoleum um, to uh, the east of you. Um, one of the things I should say is that since all of this work was completed, um, comes the responsibility to maintain all those vistas. Um, and we have just started cutting back some uh, self-sown vegetation in the vicinity of the bridge to, to reopen those vistas. It's a reminder that estates and landscapes never stand still. Um, and of course, the views that you can get in the landscape will depend very much on the time of year. Simple things like whether trees are in leaf or not. But New River Bridge is a terrific vantage point uh, to look both east and west. Just as a point to anyone that's interested as well, you can access that via a public footpath, can't you, Chris, that comes down from yeah. the gatehouse. So Yeah, the North Yorkshire Public Footpath Centenary Way actually crosses over New River Bridge. Of course, New River Bridge standing on the top of it is the least good place to look at the bridge itself. You have to be in the landscape to see the bridge. And it is actually remarkably steep, the bridge. Uh, it seems to have a very um, steep incline. I'm just running my cursor um, up the uh, either end. In fact, as you walk at it, uh, it's slightly kind of deceptive in this aerial picture. It is rather a kind of steep incline. And that's precisely so that the bridge pops up in the landscape and is visible from a far distance away. Brilliant. And then just one more question here as well, um, which is what are the slightly derelict buildings on the north side of the park near Coneystorpe, just to the left of the entrance to Holy Park? So I think that's opposite to where the Beck is in Coneystorpe. The buildings you're referring to in Coneystorpe is the old estate yard. And in fact, that's a, an 18th century configuration of buildings with 19th century alterations. And for much of the 20th century, it was the estate yard where the building teams were based, the carpentry shop and things like that. In fact, Coneysthorpe Estate Yard was where the engine house that Nesfield uh, installed the steam engine in was also um, located. Uh, and those buildings today are redundant. We've moved the estate yard to a, a different site. Uh, and as with many buildings on the estate, we're looking at what sort of future we can give these redundant buildings. It's a common question over rural buildings across uh, the UK, uh, particularly on estates. How can one uh, give them a new use? And we're exploring various options for the estate yard, and for other buildings across the estate, including Low Gately Mill, but 
very unlikely that's ever going to be a mill again, but it has great potential uh, for other sorts of buildings. So these are all parts of kind of long-term investigations. Okay, so I don't think we've got any more questions that have come in. Um, so just before we kind of sign off to everyone, uh, thank you very much for joining us again today um, for both Chris and myself. Um, we did have a question come in via email about topics, Chris, um, in particular about Queen Victoria's visit, which I believe is on the list of topics that we will be giving talks off in the future anyway. Um, um, yes, uh, I, I furnished Matt with a, a rather long list of potential topics. Um, Queen Victoria is certainly uh, one of those. Um, I'm trying to kind of make them as varied as possible. Some have sort of an outdoor focus, some that have an indoor focus, some of them are looking uh, further back in time, some of them are more recent in time. But certainly Queen Victoria is there upon or on the list um, to be talked about in the near future, um, as are such topics as tea and alcohol at Castle Hard, the railways and Castle Hard, picture collecting at Castle Hard, and also the grand tour and the travels that the family made and they're collecting. These are just some of the topics that we are lining up for the forthcoming weeks.